this Luke's Gospel passage is probably my favorite version of the Nativity of Jesus. Every time I hear it in that Charlie Brown Christmas special, I, I just eat it up. There is something so beloved about Luke's Gospel of the Nativity of Christ that it is continues to be as relevant, I believe, to today and our world as we experience it, as it was in the time when Luke wrote it, and as it was in the time when Christ was born. The more things change, the more the themes seem to remain the same. Because when I look around the world into which Christ would come to us in our day, I see many of the same universal themes that are depicted in Luke's beloved story. I see, even now, the reality of people on a forced journey, families and pregnant women among them, men under enormous strain and hardship as they struggle to understand how they can keep their families safe and together, children and infants dependent completely on the compassion of strangers. I see today, even now, the dark truths of empires. For today, Syria's civil war, the same country where Quirinius issued the proclamation, Syria's civil war is the worst humanitarian crisis of our day. Half the country's pre-war population, and that's more than 11 million people, have already been killed or forced from their homes. Families are struggling to survive inside Syria or make a new home in neighboring countries. Others are risking their lives on their way to Europe and the West, hoping to find there room in the end, acceptance and opportunity. 13.5 million people in Syria need humanitarian assistance. 4.3 million Syrians are refugees, and 6.6 .6 million are displaced within Syria itself, and half of those 6.6 .6 million are children. Most Syrian refugees, though, remain in the Middle East, in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Iraq, Jordan, in Egypt, only slightly more then 10% of the refugees have traveled to Europe. They are leaving Syria due to violence of the Syrian civil war in which we see so many killed, 12,000 of those children. About 1.5 million people have been wounded or permanently disabled. The infrastructure of Syrian society has utterly collapsed. What we know as healthcare what we know as education systems and other social systems have been utterly destroyed and their economy shattered. Syrian's children, the hope for their future, have lost parents who would teach them and siblings. They have witnessed violence that adults would stand in horror to see. In our world today, though, I also see the Lucan themes of God's message of salvation for all peoples, with the forces around us of love and justice, and an ability to unite diverse peoples around common causes, even in the midst of what is unloving and unjust. Because even on Monday of this Christmas week, a bus came to a lurching halt outside the Kenyan city of El Wak. Over 10 heavily armed Somali militants boarded the bus and shouted orders to passengers, who were mostly women, to get off the bus and to separate themselves into group by Muslim and Christian, with the intention of killing the Christians who were on board. However, the Muslim women on the bus, passed to the Christian women, headscarves and other adornments of their faith in order to disguise them and confuse 
the Somali militants. The passengers together all refused to get off the bus, <coughs> saying that they were Kenyans and not separable by religion, but by a greater identity they stood strong. In fact, the Interior Minister Joseph Nekasiri told local media, everybody can profess their own religion, but we are still one country and one people. In the world today, I also see the empowering nature of God that illuminates Luke's version of the nativity of Jesus, like the star of Bethlehem shooting light throughout. And it guides those who believe that the vulnerability of an infant is in the cradle of compassion, a promise that transformation will happen. Because in the town of Bethlehem itself, that very cradle of our Lord and of our faith. Today, the town has a population of about 25,000. However, it is surrounded by two bypass roads that only Israeli settlers can use. It is hemmed off and separated by an eight meter concrete wall from its sister city, Jerusalem. To pass to and from <coughs> requires going through inspection points and border guards in the separation wall. Prior to Palestinian control of Bethlehem, which was granted to them in 1995, there were at that time about 20,000 Christians living in the city. Today, there are less than 7,500, mostly because of the impact of the difficulty of doing business and life of the separation wall. But the town is governed today not by some foreign power, but by the Bethlehem Municipal Council, which consists of 15 elected members, including the mayor and a deputy mayor. And a special statute requires that the mayor and the majority of the municipal council be Christian, while the remaining seats are open seats and not restricted by religion. In October of 2012, municipal elections elected a Fatah member named Vera Baboon, who won and became the first female mayor of Bethlehem ever. Baboon led the Independence and Development Bloc, made up of 12 Muslims and Christians in the Fatah movement, a campaign committed to improving services and promoting tourism and equality and tolerance within the town of Bethlehem. As mayor, Baboon presides over the city with the highest unemployment bank in the West Bank. Bethlehem <coughs> has changed its demographic, and she cites the presence of the Israeli West Bank barrier as an obstacle to growth by restricting the movement of peoples, ideas, and goods. Of the city of Bethlehem, she states, we are a strangulated city with no room for expansion due to the settlements and the wall. But she hopes to stop the flow of emigration, the leaking of so many talented Muslims and Christians from Bethlehem, by creating job opportunities for their young people. And she hopes to regain international support that was lost while Hamas was in power in Bethlehem. I want you to know that prior to her election, she was the headmistress of a Roman Catholic high school. She was chairperson of a board of directors who oversaw family and child welfare, as well as gender studies, empowering women in the Arab world. She is an Arab Christian who has been noted by those who would write about her for her striking green eyes and ambition. I want you to know I have green eyes. <laughs> And I have ambition. <coughs> I have ambition because my ambitions are for the freedom and respect of all peoples, as my Lord Christ taught to me and led his followers to be. I have ambition because of the good news that has been born that we celebrate this night, a good news that is intended for all people and all faith. Would Mary and Joseph 
or the Roman Empire and Sanhedrin for that matter, have ever imagined that the God who promised to make all things new would create a reality one day in which a Christian woman was the governor of Bethlehem. Empowering leadership in all peoples was certainly modeled by Christ. And so I see Luke's hope and God's promises alive in our world today, even as I see many challenges similar to those in the world into which Jesus was born. As followers of Christ and inheritors of the legacy of the early church, we are to preach the word of God in our time and in our reality. We, all of us, God's word, as we learn tonight, is incarnate. And God's word through the Holy Spirit that we've received through baptism is incarnate in us through the words that we choose and the actions we undertake with the power to heal breaches or create them. If we are incarnating God's word, then we are working to heal, to promote peace, to work for justice, and to cultivate mutual understanding with a genuine regard for the dignity of all peoples. And yet, are there not many words that we hear that would seek to dissuade us from this good news, from the work that God would have us do? Words that cause us to doubt ourselves or accuse us of wrongdoing. In my own experience, perhaps in yours, when I have preached the good news that God's love and empowerment were incarnate in Jesus, by his lifting up of women into places of spiritual authority, I am suddenly called a feminist, as though that somehow implies that I do not sufficiently value men. When I have preached the good news that love and commitment between same-gendered persons and their families are as much a sacrament to the church as the love and commitment between opposite-gendered persons and their families, I am called a liberal, as though it were a curse word, as though somehow it would imply that I do not value alternative perspectives and people who struggle with these issues. When I have preached the good news that people of all faiths and creeds who are committed to compassion and dignity of all life, I am called insufficiently Christian, as though our faith is founded on bigotry and exclusion, when Jesus and the early church taught exactly the opposite. He taught acceptance and inclusion. And so tonight, I am again preaching good news that like with Mary and with Jesus, topples our understanding of what we thought society was or should be. It lifts up the marginalized and exhorts the comfortable to get off their tuckuses and go out into the street and out into the field, out into the wilderness, and do the work of God in building up the kingdom of God. Not once in the past, sometime long ago, done by others, but here and now, today, through us. To be all that God has made us to be. To fill our potential with all that God has given to us. Yes, I am here to preach by the holy starlight and rare full moon of this night that God came from heaven to take on our human form. To show us just how much God loves us. When God surveyed humanity and realized how dark and difficult our days could be, how confused we can get about our identity, and place, and how painful things are that we do to one another, out of our own confusion and insecurity. When God saw all of that, God decided to meet us face to face, just as we are, not as we would prefer God to be, a distant, transcendent, faraway entity, because we thought ourselves as untouchable. God came to us, personally, intimately. But note this about the infant Christ. God the Almighty 
sovereign, our Lord, did not come to punish us, or to frighten us, or to scold us, or to threaten us, or any other violent or bullying thing often attributed to God. Rather, God entered the world humbly in the stillness of the night. He came to a dwelling in a country town to a woman and a man with little to offer, with great faith. God came into the midst of our human history to tell us throughout time that we are loved deeply, truly, and forever. And just to make sure that we got this point, God first brought that message embodied in the flesh by Jesus to people the world of empire deemed not at all important. To shepherds, the lowest on the economic totem pole. To astrologers, representing people of strange fates. And to animals, looked at by most as simply a source of food, and yet by being present in the fields and at the manger, are granted a dignity because they are also part of God's creation. The angels exclaimed to the shepherds, Jesus is born for you. It's not just a good news that's impersonal, it's sort of general. It's a good news of great joy to you personally. Christ arrived from a God who wanted to be here, who wanted to be with his people. We are people meant to live from the reality of his arrival. Like Joseph and Mary, like the shepherds and the wise men, we are people who know in our own lives what it feels like to stand with those who have traveled through deep darkness and have made it through because they are called to arrive in the great light. The early church taught Christians to look for the light coming into the world at the darkest time of the solstice year. Nine months after the spring equinox, with Christ's birth celebrated exactly nine months to the day after the celebration of the Annunciation to Mary, ultimately to the early church, this concept of Emmanuel, God with us, was far more powerful than the concept of God's omnipotence. As Gregory of Nestorius once wrote in the 300s, he shares in the poverty of my flesh that I might share in the riches of his Godhead. In words of a modern theologian and poet, Suzanne Guthrie has written, in the beginning, a silent soundscape, a procession of absolute Stillness, unfolding spheres of mystery, veiled, unknowable, to the startlingly specific. The word descends, embeds, gestates, unfurls as grace upon grace, deep rooted love within love. And so heaven and earth unite in the word made flesh, the welling among us. Not then. Not now, not once, but evermore. God came to be with us. The long ago night of the shepherds and angels and stars was just a beginning. Christ continues to be with us now in the simple wonders of this night and in our lives. Christmas isn't just once upon a time or one day but for always, because it is for us God's gift of love for all people. And so preach this good news, my friends. Live it. Act from it. Speak from it. And trust the God who has so humbly and vulnerably <coughs> entrusted himself into your care on this night. And every day that you walk upon this amazing